want my life to do some good here. I want my life to make a change. This week on the show, putting care at the center. MacArthur Award winner Ai Jen Poo, director of the Domestic Workers Alliance, says the choices we face today about how to care for our elders could restructure the entire 21st century economy for the better. Then a short film about why that might be a good idea. No Sanctuary looks at how the U.S. treats immigrant families by locking them up. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Caring for an elderly family member involves such a wide range of skills and expertise that only a superhuman person could do it. Lifting, medicating, filing 20-page government assistant forms, and managing appointments. Our next guest writes that it's virtually impossible for one person to do it. And yet, tens of millions of Americans, and millions more in the years to come, are individually called upon to juggle all of those tasks. When those people aren't family members, they tend to be some of the least protected and most precarious people in our economy, domestic workers. Ai Jin Poo is director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and co-founder of Domestic Workers United, the organization that spearheaded the New York's historic Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. Her new book, just released, is called The Age of Dignity, Preparing for the Elder Boom in a Changing America. Hi, Jen. Welcome back to the program. So glad to have you. Thank you. It's great to be back. Congratulations on the book and on your birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thanks for coming <laughs> in. What is the picture on the front of the book? It is the tree of life. And why is that sitting there? It's about rethinking how we live well through every stage of life. And this book, it talks about lots of demographic changes and um, and the fact that there's no question that the country is aging, and it really poses the question, how do we live well as we age in the 21st century, given all the change that's happening around us? So how are we aging these days? First off, what's the elder boom? And then how are we actually managing it right now? The elder boom is a direct uh, product of the baby boom generation reaching retirement age at a rate of about 10,000 people per day. So in 2015, 4 million Americans will turn 65. And then my grandmother's demographic of 87 and older is the fastest growing demographic in the country because people are living longer as a result of advances in healthcare and medicine. So by 2030, we will have 20% of our population over the age of 65. And who is the burden of all that falling on? You know, it's really affecting all of us. Uh, Rosalind Carter once said that there's only four kinds of people in the world, people who are caregivers or will be caregivers, people who need caregivers or will need caregivers. And most of us are probably more than one of those identities at any given moment. And I think that that's actually more true than ever mm -hmm. before. By the year 2050, 27 million Americans will need some form of long-term care assistance just to meet their basic daily needs. And so it's kind of an all hands on deck situation where we're gonna need more families to step up, more individuals to prepare better, and more of a workforce. The caregiving workforce has to be stronger and larger than ever before. Well, who are the majority of our caregiving workforce right now. Domestic workers is a pretty broad term. It is. There's um, the direct care workforce, which is everyone who cares for or whose paid profession is to support either an elder or a person with a disability. It's a total of about three million workers, and that's not including everyone who's working in the shadows, in the gray, they call it the gray market. Um, and it is a workforce that is um, many women of color, many immigrant women, and, um, and one where the average wages are under $9 an hour, and one that is not even protected by our basic minimum wage and overtime laws. So it's poverty wages, high rates of turnover and burnout because of just how challenging the work is and how isolating it is, completely undervalued, and really unstable as a result. And how 
is it getting paid for? Because I've spoken to some of the people in this equation. The workers are not getting paid enough, but the people who are trying to pay for their services are very strapped too, many of them, not all. Everyone's struggling in this equation. It's the workers are struggling to survive off of poverty wages. Families are struggling to afford the care that they need. And right now we have no public program to support our long-term care needs. I mean, it's kind of shocking that in 2015 we don't have anything in place. So if you're very wealthy, you could afford long-term care insurance, but even that often does, doesn't cover what you need. Mm -hmm. And if you're very, very poor, you could be eligible for Medicaid, but oftentimes that doesn't support what you need, especially if you don't want to go to a nursing home. And so there's just millions of us who are caught in this gap, really struggling to figure out how we're going to get these basic care needs met. You talk in the book about what you've learned from your mother and your grandmother and how this came to be your issue. You've, you've touched on that here, but how did it get to be so personal for you? Well, it's, you know, spending almost the last 20 years working alongside domestic workers and just seeing the enormous pride that they take in the work that they do and the enormous disconnect between that, what they give to our families every day and how our society and our economy actually values them and their work. On top of that, I had the great fortune of growing up with my grandparents really involved in my childhood. and. Um, my grandfather ended up, um, in the last three months of his life, spending them in a nursing home where he was alone and afraid. And um, I will never forget the images of visiting him there and just what it felt like to see him dying inside. And um, he wanted to stay at home. You know, that's what he wanted, and we weren't able to give that to him. On the other hand, my grandmother, who I'm going to visit tomorrow in LA and celebrate our birthdays together, um, you know, she lives life on her own terms at 89. She goes to church twice a week. She sings in the church senior choir. She's got a mahjong group. Um, she gets her hair done, permed, you know, once a month. And she's just um, still living well because she's supported by a home care worker. And it just kind of came full circle for me that if we were to really value this work that's so fundamental to families getting the support they need, it's about valuing the people like my grandmother who we love, who cared for us, and it strengthens the economy. What are the roots that you've discovered of this undervaluing. You quote Governor Patterson of New York when you were trying to pass the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights and what he said about the origins of the way that we don't protect domestic workers. He talks about it and we talk about it as part of a long legacy of racism embedded in our laws. How so? You know, in the 1930s, a lot of people don't know this history, but when the New Deal was passed, along with our cornerstone labor protections like the Fair Labor Standards Act or the National Labor Relations Act, Southern members of Congress refused to sign on to those bills if they included protections for farm workers and domestic workers who were, of course, African American at the time. And so in a concession to those members of Congress from the South, Congress passed all of those bills with those exclusions in place. And we're still struggling to this day to gain overtime protection, minimum wage and overtime protections for home care workers. They're still excluded under this loophole called the companionship exemption, which is all about not recognizing this work as real work. I remember that we talked about this for an article I wrote for The Nation magazine about your work That's right. back, I guess, about a year after Barack Obama had been elected, and the expectation was this would be changed on his watch. Yes, and he committed to it, and both secretaries of labor have committed to it, moved it forward, and it was supposed to go into effect that two million home care workers would be protected on January 1st of 2015 under basic wage and hour laws until a lawsuit um, in D.C. District Court essentially got onto the desk of a judge who essentially vacated the entire rule. And so we're now really fighting to appeal that decision and really figure out how is it that after 75 years of exclusion, 
in 2015, when we need to be strengthening and growing this workforce, we're still fighting for these basic protections. And while we're talking about obstacles, your movement took another hit, or maybe I should say we all took another hit, when in the Supreme Court case Harris versus Quinn, it looked as if they were once again undermining the rights of, of domestic workers. In a nutshell, can you explain what happened there? Well, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the role of unions in our popular culture. And I would say the home care unions in particular. You know, the home care union in Illinois, I was there for the 30th anniversary of the founding of it and met some of the founders who are now in their 90s, pushing 100 African American women who migrated from Mississippi and Alabama to Chicago in search of a better life for their families, doing caregiving work because they love to take care of people earning 50 cents a dollar, a dollar 50 an hour. And they formed this organization because they believe in the profession, the dignity of this work. And through having a union, they were able to increase their wages from something like $2 an hour to 12 and establish a training program and make this work better, mm -hmm. improve the quality of care. I mean, it really has been a win-win to have these jobs be rec recognized, dignified jobs. And this court case really highlighted one very particular aspect of unionization, which is that unions are negotiating for wages and training and all kinds of benefits for the entire workforce. And as a result, they're taking um, a portion for to support union programming out of wages. And somebody didn't want that to happen and there was the the case went all the way up to the supreme court um, but the truth of the matter is is the union still exists and people are still joining because it really was the path out of poverty for this workforce and for many it still is so let's talk about your strategies for how we change the situation because mm -hmm. clearly we need major change and we need it fast mm -hmm. you talk about a care grid mm -hmm. maybe you could lay out some of the sort of policy components of that and then i want to talk about who the components are of your alliance um, and where the stumbling blocks are with that yeah so there's First the care grid. The care grid is a kind of all hands on deck, communities, families, public policy makers, all of us, private, non private sector nonprofits coming together and establishing an infrastructure that supports care in three dimensions. Accessibility and affordability for families, high quality care, um, and high quality jobs for the workforce. Those are three core components of the care grid for the future. And so we think that it's gonna be everything from the village movement that's growing around the country where seniors are forming communities and through sharing essentially resources and skills and, um, and purchasing power, they're able to do everything from strengthen their caregiving supports to buy groceries at a reduced rate um, to actually supporting transportation. So villages are one example of a community-based solution. Um, an example of a public policy solution is the Keep Me Home initiative in Maine where they have a comprehensive policy agenda to support seniors to age in place. Mm -hmm. And it includes everything from changing transportation systems to raising wages for caregivers. And then we are going around the country asking families to have a conversation about how they're gonna prepare for their future caregiving needs. Um, we're asking families to talk to each other about making plans for the future and also thinking about what they imagine will be the joys of caring for one another in the future so that we can all turn towards the solutions we need and also call upon our elected officials to create the public policy infrastructure and supports that we need. Well, that's going to take more than just a movement around domestic workers. And you're describing a movement that is way broader than just the workers' that's movement. Right. And it goes back, or it takes me back to your tree of life idea of how are we living our lives. For many of us, we kind of have our careers, have our jobs, and then we think, oh my gosh, about now I better start working, worrying about the future and about care, or maybe my parents' care, mm -hmm. or my kids. You talk about a sandwich generation. What you're describing in, is a kind of fundamental shift in how we think about all of our lives. Does it have implications for the way we structure the economy too? 
Absolutely. I think that the fact of the matter is, is that the interests of consumers are, in this case, seniors and people with disabilities, and the families that they're a part of, the workers who care for those families, and the families that they're a part of are completely interdependent. There is no way around the connection between a worker being able to live and support uh, their family on their wages and the quality of care they're able to provide for their work for the people that they support is completely interconnected right. and interdependent. So if we're going to solve the caregiving needs of the country for the future, we have to think about those interests as one. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, is that in the economy at large, we are actually all interdependent. Whether it's as immediate as you feel it in the family structure, workers, consumers, families, employers, we actually all need each other. Mm -hmm. And so the care kind of movement, the caring majority that we're trying to build through Caring Across Generations, what we're trying to do is model a way of thinking about how we come together to create the economy of the future mm -hmm that recognizes everyone's dignity. It's a kind of post-industrial model of how you make progress. I mean, you talked about unions. I know you're a union supporter, but this is not a union model where you do collective bargaining and try to get a bonus or a, a, a boon for your group. You're it's talking about something model. else. But how do you support it? Harold Myerson, writing uh, not so long ago at the beginning of the year, talked about the, the dangers of this model also, because how do you raise your funds if you're not about organizing tons of people to be members and pay dues? Well, you know, lots of, like the AARP is a membership organization where people pay dues. When people believe in something, they contribute to it. And so we hope to have a movement where that is the case. Mm -hmm. And we also hope to have a movement that really meets people's needs, that really, where people can really see their hopes and dreams reflected back. And that, um, and that they'll invest in the movement as part of an investment or a down payment in the future they want to see. And is there a model out there in the world, in addition to the village movement here in the States, that inspires you? Oh, there's so much. I mean, you know, Japan and Germany have long-term care as, part, as a part of a holistic um, social insurance program that they have that is about health care and retirement security and all in one. And I think that that kind of a holistic program where you can ex expect some universalisms actually makes a lot of sense, particularly in an economy where um, so much is changing, where work is changing, and so many people are working in temporary or part-time or self-employed contexts. We need to establish more of a universal baseline, a 21st century safety net, so to speak, that acknowledges the varied ways in which people are working in this economy. So imagine yourself at 80. What's your fantasy, your vision, where you're trying to get? Well, in the book, I do this exercise because my friend Sarah Horowitz from the Freelancers Union always asks me to do this exercise, which is to imagine if we could just erase, wipe the slate clean, what would we want our futures to look like? And I was thinking it wouldn't be so, so different in that it would involve a lot of yoga, friends, community. Um, but I think what felt different about imagining it in my book was just the notion that um, through every stage of life, we would be connected, connected to other people, connected to other generations, and that we would have the support we need and the resources and the resources in terms of relationships. Um, we need to live well with dignity. And for me, that means yoga and gardening and um, happy hour. <laughs> um, but I think for everybody, it'll mean different things with some universal sense of support there. Hi, Jen. Thank you so much. And thank you for the book, The Age of Dignity, Preparing for the Elder Boom in a Changing America. It's just out. Great to have you. Thank you. News alert. The crisis at our border is getting worse. One group says it's time to call in the National Guard to protect the border. No! 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 No!
protesters block the road outside the Border Patrol facility. Three buses filled with about 140 children and adults were stopped outside. This man spit on a supporter of the immigrants. The undocumented immigrants were flown in from Texas. We're working to make sure that we have sufficient facilities to detain, house, and process them appropriately. Estábamos en un lugar de, de detención, este, ahí no podíamos salir. I represent Sarah and Nayeli. Sarah, they're from El Salvador. Sarah fled the country. She was fleeing both family violence and gang violence, very severe violence. The people detained at Kearns are women and children, almost all from Central America, almost all seeking asylum in the United States, although a lot of women I meet are fleeing domestic violence, they're also fleeing other types of violence. These are prison companies and their model and their experience is running prisons, not running childcare facilities. So who stands to benefit? Well, the prison corporations are gonna make a lot of money out of this. They've already started talking about this at their stockholder meetings and they're gonna make a lot of money uh, the more detention there is, they're paid by the number of people that are detained. And so they stand to make a lot of money out of family detention, as they would probably say it's a whole new income stream. When the families get here, they need lots of love. They need, um, they need a shower, they're hungry, they may need to see a doctor, they need clean clothes. Yeah. When my neighbor's in trouble, I help my neighbor. These people are our neighbors. They're our neighbors and we need to help them. Families, uh, families are ready? Yay! Bienvenidos! You know, people could be doing all kinds of stuff, but everybody stops what they're doing just to clap for the families when they come in. ¿Por qué en vez de poner más detenciones como eso, por qué no le dan la oportunidad a las madres, a las madres que vienen con sus hijos, a que le den un mejor futuro a sus hijos? ¿Cuánto dinero están gastando en eso? ¿Por qué no gastan en la lamentada reforma migratoria para el bienestar de, 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 del ser humano, vaya, digamos, no del latino, del ser humano? I woke up this morning with my mind louder. Say The leader of the National Taxi Workers Alliance says app-based Uber is crushing workers' rights. The problem here is Uber is fundamentally anti-regulation. They are as neoliberal as you get. They claim to be new money, but they're as old money as capital gets. And also on the show, Esther Cooper Jackson, who spent a century in the struggle. We're in the middle, still in the middle of a struggle for our rights. So I think across the country we're seeing kind of a revitalized workers movement that looks more, uh, looks less like a kind of traditional union and more like what the kind of labor movement used to look in the 20s and 30s where entire communities were demanding dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. 